Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packwell and welcome to EWTN Live, a show where we bring you guests from all over the world, which we are doing today. Uh, but first, I want to mention that today is the memorial of the Queenship of Mary. It's the end of the octave celebrating the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and which we had on the 15th, of course. And the culmination and the purpose of her Assumption is to receive the eternal reward. Now, all of us will receive a crown from God. This is something that will belong to all. That's why you see in Revelation, all the saints have these crowns, which they throw down before God, because He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But Our Lady also, of course, is crowned. And she has a queenship beyond the rest of the saints because of her sanctity and because of the role she played, the unique role in salvation by bearing our Lord and following Him in faith through the cross and all the way to heaven. So we celebrate this great feast today. Now, we have a guest tonight. Uh, he was the youngest Roman Catholic bishop in the world when he was consecrated at the age of 32. And he will begin celebrating his 60th year as a priest coming up this next November. He served as the president of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue for 18 years and prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments for six years. With all of his years of experience in evangelization, he has written a wonderful book called The Evangelizing Parish which is meant especially to help priests as well as the rest of the members of the parish to realize their opportunities to be strong spiritual leaders and help each other as parishioners become committed and effective evangelists. So please welcome His Eminence, Francis Cardinal Arinzi. <laughs> Cardinal Arinzi, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to have you. And I, I like mentioning how we have guests internationally. You are from Nigeria originally. Yes. But now you've been living in Rome for a long time. Only 34 years. Well, that's starting to be a long time. That's a good, <laughs> that's as long as I've been doing TV shows. All here. right. And it's um, starting to be, it's starting to add up, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and. You know, one of the things uh, that is always a risk and opportunity, every part of life is a risk and an opportunity. The risk of being in Rome so long is like being in Washington, D.C. You get closed in on all the government and you don't know what's going on outside. Or you can see it as an opportunity to open up to the whole world because so much of the world comes to Rome. And it's depending on which approach you take. Reading your book is very clear that you took the opportunity to keep a wide perspective on the world and on history. Because I was very impressed how you showed this awareness of the needs of the parish different needs in different parts of the world, whether it's Oceania or Africa, Europe or the Americas and so on, Australia. You have a wide awareness of that and you come to say, here's how we can help our parishes become the centers of evangelizing. And I really enjoyed that part of your book. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you yeah, for your attentiveness. No, it's, 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 it's uh, something that comes right out. And one of the first things I want to ask you about is you also have an historical sense. You talk about how the parish was not something the apostles as such established. It developed over time. 
give us a quick rundown of how the parish became what it is today. You are right. When our Lord came, he chose 12 apostles. And then there were wider disciples, 72. He sent them. Going back to heaven, he said, as my father sent me, I also send you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Yep. Now, they began. He didn't say to them, I'll start St. Jude's parish, <laughs> <laughs> and I will start St. Peter's parish. He could not have done that. No. The apostles began. St. Grad Jude wasn't a saint yet. <laughs> <laughs> Gradually then, the apostles spread. The Acts of Apostles tell us about the first steps. St. Paul, Barnabas, um, Silas, Timothy. Gradually, they began establishing churches, which are technically now called particular churches or dioceses, mm -hmm. where a bishop is. There is around him a church. Mm -hmm. And then the bishop has priests. He does not himself contact all the people in his diocese. No. So gradually then, the church decided how to make boundaries of the dioceses. And the priests in the beginning stayed more or less with the bishop, what we would call the big centers, cities. From there, they went to evangelize, bring the people the word of God, baptize, celebrate the Holy Eucharist, and they came back to the same house. Gradually, gradually, the idea grew then of units with distances. All the priests couldn't live with the bishop in the same place. That's the origin of parishes until the Council of Trent made it then canonically, legally in the church, a law that there is a territory assigned to a priest within a diocese. That's a parish. And the, the bishop commissions each pastor, you know, that he, he gives him uh, not just, okay, <laughs> this is your next job. No, it's, it's really very much a commissioning by the bishop to share in the leadership of the diocese by being the pastor of this particular parish. Exactly. If the bishop could be with all his diocesan people each day, celebrate mass with them, <clears throat> talk with them, baptize their children, bury their dead, teach them Christian doctrine every Sunday, there would be no need for parishes. But he cannot, so he sends the priests. <clears throat> they are in union with him. They are a team, and he is their leader. Mm -hmm. So, they do their work in union with the bishop and in the name of the bishop. You will notice, at every mass, we name the pope, church universal, and the bishop of the diocese of the place where that mass is being celebrated. Yep. Which means church universal and church local. So. That's the idea. So that the Second Vatican Council speaks of the priests as representatives of the bishop. So when they celebrate, they are in union with him. But at the same time, the pastors and all of his assistants, sometimes an assistant priest or two, Yes. Sometimes religious brothers and sisters, and always lots of lay people. You bring out 99.9% .9 of the church are lay people. Exactly. So they are, they're, they're, it's not that the priest is the parish, but everybody involved is the parish. It's the whole community that is the parish. And you, you bring out the Vatican II teaching. We don't get saved as individuals, but as a community. Yes. And the parish is <coughs> the primary community of salvation. You are right. The parish is not really the buildings. It is not the territory. 
Although the territory marks the boundaries of the parish, the church, the parish church, is where the people of God gather. But the parish actually is the people of God in that area, all of them. Mm -hmm. Uniting them, baptism, and their leader, the pastor, mm -hmm. the parish priest. Then he, he may have other priests working with him, <clears throat> but he is only their leader. <clears throat> the captain of a team is not the whole team, it's just one person. But he needs all the people, and then they all form one team. If they win, it is a victory for the team. If they lose, it is the team that loses. So it is the parish then that is the local presence of the church, the church at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. So the Second Vatican Council you quoted, that's the document on the church, paragraph 9, says mm -hmm. that God could have saved us as individuals, but he has decided to save us as community. So we Indeed, baptism, faith, we profess our faith in the community of the church. We receive baptism in the church, through the church. We become members of Christ in the church, through the church. It isn't an individual affair, but the individual will also confess. You can say, I confess, but also we confess. So, the parish then <coughs> is the lowest placed unit of the church that evangelizes. That's the thing that I want to talk about, because when you talk about winning or losing as a team, yes, the goal of the parish is not to win big prizes by having a big collection. You know, making a lot of money for the parish is not the goal. The goal is evangelizing other people whether it be the members of our own families, our children that are born without the faith, or whether it's the, it's the people in the larger society. But evangelizing is one of the roles that you see in this book, in the title of the book, uh, in the chapters. Evangelizing is the great task of this parish team. And I like that. Yes, so that we can, if we are to ask, what is the, suppose there are 100 parishes in your diocese. What is the parish that has performed best? Is it the parish that put up more buildings? Is it the parish that gathered more money? Is it the parish that has um, some of the richest people in terms of money? We do not condemn buildings. We need them. We don't gather under a tree. We do not say money is not good. It serves as a servant. It's a tool. But not as a master. Right. When he becomes a master, it is pitiless. So the parish that succeeds is the one that carries the message of salvation in Jesus Christ best. That means the parish then that puts the people in link with Jesus Christ, that increases faith in Christ, that increases worship of God. The parish that makes people more aware of God, the parish that serves the poor, the sick, the old, the forgotten. There are three things the parish does. You will notice the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that book of only 700 pages, you know. Yeah. If, if you read two pages a day, you finish it in one year. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's well, not too bad. You can no, easily do that. Uh, so, it's put together by the best brains in the church in our times. Four parts. Part one, what we believe. Part two, worship, how we worship. Part three, how we live. And part four, how we pray. So doctrine, worship, service, prayer. Many Catholics are accustomed to parish for doctrine, teaching, and also for worship, of course, mass, baptism, funeral, and so on. But they don't often think of parish as service, called diaconia sometimes. That means service of the poor, the sick, the old, the needy, the handicapped. What our Lord tells us 
in Matthew 25, I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you visited me. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. Hungry, you gave me to eat. In short, the whole area of service of our neighbor is an important arm of evangelization. In fact, those are what the church identifies as the as six of the seven acts of mercy, the, of corporal uh, works of mercy. Yes. And the seventh one is to bury the dead. That's you know, that comes from the book of Tobit. The rest come from that, that parable. Yes. And this is part of what the church, and you don't hear enough about the corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy. Both need to be done, and the parish is the place to learn it. Exactly. That is why I insisted in that book that no matter how big a parish is, care has to be taken that the individual does not feel forgotten. Suppose there's an old woman who has not come to Mass two Sundays, three Sundays. Nobody said anything. The church was full each Sunday, so the priest was happy. And the parish council were happy because the church was full. The woman who was not there did not talk. Now, suppose nobody remembers or notices that. After some time, it becomes a fault in the parish. Mm -hmm. But suppose the parish had a social services committee, even if it's only three people. And these three people are the eyes, the hands, the feet of the parish. And the parish is told, if you know any member who is sick or old or who has not come to Mass, tell this committee and they visit this person. Mm -hmm. Oh, sir, sister, brother, we noticed you were not at Mass the last two Sundays. Maybe you were not well. Did something happen? Or maybe you got angry with the parish priest or some other person, what happened? That person gets convinced, I am not forgotten, mm -hmm. I count. When you have a very big parish, it is a risk that the individual can get forgotten. A parish should think of a unit that acts in its place. The parish priest cannot do everything himself. No. But someone in the name of the parish should visit the one who needs a visit. Some people are not poor in terms of money, but they may be lonely, they may be sick, they may want somebody to go to the supermarket for them, or to clean their house, or to do some other service, or simply to sit there and talk. Some people are just happy to be visited, mm -hmm. and they offload their headaches. Yep. If the group that visited cannot solve it, they will refer back to the parish or council or priest and within the parish, the parish should know what to do. Then that parish is alive. This is uh, and it's something that is meant to involve again, as you said, the priest cannot do it. He can't. It's, Alone. Uh, by himself. But uh, and neither can the sisters and brothers do it. It takes everybody being involved. And that includes all the way down to the children. Children need to learn service of people who are worse off than they are yes. at an early age. It's all too easy. Kids who think, well, I don't have what all my other friends have. And I, I'm just, you know, they, they get everything. I don't have anything. And kids can start to whine a bit until they see someone who has a bigger difficulty. It's very important to include them in service of people in need. Important. We must not say to children, you are the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. Exactly. Uh -huh. And tomorrow. They are to be associated with church work, making mm -hmm. allowance for age, performance, mm -hmm. place, customs, and so on. The world is very big. 
So every parish has to be elastic in these arrangements. But forget no one, because everyone can contribute something. And in that way, the individual learns. Even of a tree procession, donation, the church has what is called Holy Infant Association. The little children are taught, even when they are little, to give from their little pocket money, even if it's just a few coins. Mm -hmm. So they learn to give. Our Lord told us, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I, I certainly remember the sisters teaching us to do that when I was a small boy, you know, in school, that we would have these little boxes where we, instead of buying candy for ourselves and such, we would use it for people who were much poorer than we, uh, oftentimes in the missions. And it's, um, I, 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 that, that's an important lesson. But there's another aspect of this that in, in your book. <laughs> It's not only making sure that the parish community is maintained. You also talk about the importance of the parish going into the deeps, into the culture, like St. John Paul, whom you knew well, you know, that he, he told us to go into the deeps to draw people to Christ and that we have to go beyond the parish to invite people who are also often very lost in this modern world. You are right. Pope Francis often says that he prefers a church that gets some mud in the shoes because mm -hmm. it went out to meet people mm -hmm. than a church that sits in the comfort zone within, locks itself up mm -hmm. within is self-referential, mm -hmm. as Pope Francis puts it, mm -hmm. which means the parish must be outgoing. It must ask itself, where is my service needed? Mm -hmm. It may be other Christians who are within your parish. You visited them, you made friends with them. Some of them may want to know about the Catholic faith. Some of them may even want to join us. It may be lapsed Catholics who no longer come to church for some reason. You visited them, you talked with them, or is religion for you a contraband good which we hide from the customs? Isn't religion good news to be announced at midday sunshine? So that's one area. Then the whole area of non-Christians, those who don't believe in Christ at all. I worked for 18 years in the office of the church for contact with other believers, whether they want to be Christians or not. Mm. Can you imagine that Christians and Muslims alone form more than one half of humanity? Mm -hmm. And that Asia, which has a, more, about 60% of world population, is largely non-Christian, yep. except for the Filipinos and some Indians, which means... And, and, and now parts, uh, uh, there's a large Christian community in South Korea. Yes. And a growing one in China, but these are, yeah. Th Only these with are reference to the millions of Asia. Right. The right. number of Christians goes down, yep. which means Christians must not hide in the sacristy of St. Peter's Basilica or of their parish church and forget the outer world. They must ask themselves, what can we do? The whole area of culture in the country, that means press, radio, television, what people talk about, the whole area of politics, professions, medical, nursing, law, trade, commerce, who will Christianize them from within? That is what Vatican II calls the layperson's distinctive role. That's, you know, that's a very important, as a priest and as a cardinal, you and I 
cannot even go inside some businesses because their insurance doesn't allow it in this country. You know, it's the Catholic workers in those shops and factories and businesses and corporations who are in there who are called to evangelize those areas of life. Yes, which means the parish and for wider apostolates, the diocese should um, encourage lay people and show them more light about how they can evangelize those areas. Vatican II calls those areas areas of secular life, that is life in society, the everyday life, which means in practice, family, work. Work will mean professions, doctor, lawyer, commerce, then politics and government, House of Representatives, the Senate, those who govern mm -hmm. at many levels, Brussels, European Union, American, all over the world, it is human beings who must be there. It is the lay people who are to evangelize these from within. That means they are to bring the spirit of Christ into these areas, science, culture. This, there's a, a, a Protestant American preacher of the 1800s who at one point said, if there's corruption in the government, it's the fault of the pulpits. If there's corruption and thievery in business, it's the fault of the pulpits. If there is immorality and the breakdown of the family, it's the fault of the pulpits. His point was, Christians don't address the corruption, they just complain about it. Yes. They gossip about businessmen <coughs> who are corrupt but they don't evangelize these politicians that are corrupt and business people that are corrupt and so on. And this must be, our, we must have our lay people take that on. Exactly. The lay people, that is what Vatican II calls in the document on the church in the world of today, paragraph 43, the lay person's distinctive role. Yes. and says that in these areas, the lay people must not look up to the cleric, that means the priest or bishop, for the answer to every question that arises, or even think that this is their mission. For instance, a question that is political or economic or cultural. So they, they will get the doctrine from the priests, but they will then get in and bring the spirit of Christ to those areas. We put it this way. The lay persons must not imagine that once you come to Mass on Sunday, you are a good Christian. There is the story about Paddy Smith. Paddy Smith is not from um, Birmingham, uh. but it is said of him, Paddy Smith always came to Mass. He never missed a Sunday, but Paddy Smith went to hell for what he did on Monday. That means, for Paddy Smith, religion was one hour on Sunday in church. And but when you saw him on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, as a dock worker, dock worker, as a trade unionist, as a civil servant, as a police officer, you wouldn't believe it was the same Paddy Smith we saw on Sunday, mm -hmm. singing a high mass, mm -hmm. which means he has not brought his religion into his profession, into the life of every day. Mm -hmm. So. He is not a good Christian because he reduced religion to one hour on Sunday morning every week. And sometimes it's as if, okay, I clocked in. It's like I put my time card in for the hour. Yes. I'm done. Now I can do what I want to do. That's not the idea. Mistake. As some lay people said, one lay person said to me, look, once I sneak into heaven, I'm all right. It is for you priests to preach bad theology. You don't sneak into heaven. You, you don't go to heaven alone. And you do not go in secret. No. You'll have to believe in Christ. And religion is good news. Somebody who thinks about sneaking into heaven 
might be sneaking around his own business or politics at, on, on his terms and, and not really going forward. That you can't fool God. He won't be mocked, as St. Paul says. Yeah. You have to be straight up with our Lord. And the parish is where you get the nourishment of the Eucharist and the teaching of the gospel to go into the world to evangelize. You are right, and it is important. You mentioned the Eucharist. We do not, with human energy, only evangelize. We absolutely need the help of God's grace to begin, to continue, and to conclude. The Holy Mass is the biggest and the most important celebration. The Vatican Council calls the Eucharistic celebration fount and apex of the whole Christian life. We get energy. Then at the end of Mass, we are told, the Mass is ended, go. Not go to rest. Go and share what we have prayed, what we have received, what we have meditated, what we have sung. So the Mass has a dynamic dimension. It sends us to evangelize. That's exactly what the Ite Misa Est means. Go, you've been sent. Yes. We have to take a break. So we're going to come back in a couple of minutes and we'll continue this conversation and get some questions as well. So y'all, please stay with us. Thank you. And again, I want to recommend uh, His Eminence's book. Uh, it's called The Evangelizing Parish by Franz Francis Cardinal Orinzi. You can get a copy of it at EWTNRC.com. EWTNRC.com. And uh, it, it really is a great read. I, I, I've enjoyed it very much. And I, I think you will too. It's, it's a clear, as a matter of fact, it's the kind of thing I would recommend. I don't know if you thought about this eminence, but I would recommend that groups of people within the parish use this as a study amongst themselves uh, and with their priest as to reflect on what we can do better. That would be a good, exactly. It's good one Bible. of my aims in writing it. Good. Well, it, it, it occurred to me, I could just imagine parish groups using this with their pastor and other assistant leaders and such in the church. Definitely. Let's take a question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Morris, Illinois. Very good. Southwest to have of you Chicago. Here. <coughs> there you go. And uh, what's your question? Well, first, I'd like to say it's a very great honor to be able to ask you a question, Your Eminence. So. Um, the, what comes to mind as I'm listening to this wonderful discussion is the fact that John Paul II, he called on parishes to become schools of prayer. And I've also read um, books that talk about how the West can be, is very active, you know, they're more active, like what can we do? And we, I think many people forget to, that it all has to come from prayer and that our, our uh, you know, meditating on scripture and allowing it to transform us so that our work can be sanctified, to me is the foundation. And I just would like to, love to have your comments on that. You are right. It's a very important dimension 
of parish life. I gave it one whole chapter in the book titled The Parish Prayers. And the prayer of the parish, you can consider it under three headings. The liturgical prayer in the name of the church. Principal, the mass. Fount and apex. Without the mass, we don't have the church. Then, apart from mass, all the ways of honoring our Lord in the Holy Eucharist outside mass. Adoration in the chapel, uh, Eucharistic benediction, procession, Eucharistic Congress, which can be national, diocesan, and international. International every four years or so. <coughs> the Pope announces this each time. So that's one area. Then all the other sacraments are celebrations of the parish. Baptism, confirmation, penance, marriage, ordination. That's one area. Second area of prayer is the well, of liturgy still, the prayer of the church for the various hours of the day, especially morning prayer, evening prayer, vespers, and then the blessings of people, things, and so on. That's liturgical prayer. Then there is community prayer, rosary, uh, prayer to the Blessed Virgin Mary, prayer to the saints, shrines, pilgrimages. Then there is the third area, personal prayer, in which many Catholics are a bit lacking. Many Catholics, for them to pray is only to read prayer already written out. But there is also necessary that prayer that comes from the heart, the individual. Even the book for Mass, the Missal from Rome, says there must be silence for personal prayer at various times before Mass at the penitential act, then after the readings, a little pause so that people can reflect. After the homily, time so they can reflect. And especially after receiving Christ in Holy Communion so that they can thank him. And at the end of Mass, personal prayer helps us to join in liturgical prayer in the family. There should be personal prayer, individual, and group. The father and mother of the family should be able to gather their children when they eat, when they travel, when the child is going to college, going to boarding house, coming home after a long journey. Why don't the parents impose their hands on the children and pray for them? In short, personal prayer becomes very important. The rosary every day in that way, because without spiritual help, which we call grace, actual grace. We can't achieve anything of what for our salvation. So prayer becomes a very important aspect of evangelization. And I've noticed in parishes over the past decades where uh, there are extremes. On one hand, some parishes, I don't think it's true anymore, but there was a fad of removing the Blessed Sacrament, removing the tabernacle, putting it uh, sometimes even in a closet. You couldn't find it. But then the other, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, and I noticed the first step was usually to remove the crucifix from the church. Mistake. And secondly, the tabernacle would go next. That was typical. But then we see something else as a, the counter movement. Parishes that have regular Eucharistic adoration, sometimes perpetual, sometimes once a week or once a month, those parishes do not become turned in. What one, two of the pastors said to me, they were opposed to having Eucharistic adoration in their church because they were afraid people would become too inward. And he said, that's the opposite. The more they get to be with Jesus in a personal prayer time, the more he motivated them to go out and evangelize. He said, now I have no control. There's so much evangelizing going on. 
is beyond anything I could have organized, but it comes from the interior prayer. And so do vocations in the parishes where there's Eucharistic adoration and that time to be alone with Christ, people can listen to what their vocation is. Sometimes I've known couples who propose to each other before the Blessed Sacrament. Others who find vocation to religious life or to the priesthood. And we need to have that time with Jesus without, and he won't let us, he won't let us neglect the service. He's, he's too pushy. You are right. I think John 15, Jesus tells us, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. He didn't say without me, you can do very little. Nothing. <laughs> the theologians say, put it this way, that grace <coughs> will prevenient, grace begins the good work in us, continues the good work in us, and brings it to happy conclusion not without our cooperation. Because St. Augustine, God who made you without your cooperation will not save you without your cooperation. But without God's grace, we can't achieve anything for our salvation. Exactly. So, so evangelization must have as its base the strength that God's grace gives. Adoration of the Holy Eucharist becomes therefore central yeah, you Eucharistic devotion is central in parish life, where people adore the Lord and have him at the center. They are having their priorities right. We have to focus on Jesus Christ. Yes. That's absolutely essential. It is he that we serve. Many people saw Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Saint and they admired her and her sister, the work they do. But they don't know that Mother Teresa and her sisters do about one or two hours adoration early in the morning before they get out to serve the sick and the needy. And Mother Teresa gets written near the tabernacle, I thirst. Christ is thirsty on the cross, not just for water. And they didn't even give him good water, but only vinegar. But He's thirsty for our love. He wants us to love him. We should love God who first loved us. By being near him in the Holy Eucharist, we get a little of his fire. And when you have Eucharistic fire, you can inspire. Ma'am, where are you from? <clears throat> My name is Marianne. I'm from Hampton, Virginia. Any I just question? First want to say welcome, His Eminence, to the United States. Um, I was just questioning um, about how we are small in feeding the sick, feeding the people. Um, it seems in our parishes they're small, and you know we can do food drives and things. But what about on the international level as our church? Because it seems like we don't really see that uh, baby in Africa or China that is starving. You know, like or I feel like, what? How can we han handle that level of? evangelization. The church makes a big effort. Beginning from the parish, every diocese should have an office for justice, peace, development. There's generally called Caritas office because there is a, an, a big office in the Vatican City called Caritas International, which is for emergency situations. Earthquakes, um, flooding, uh, desert, uh, desert areas, areas that need immediate help. <clears throat> then there is another section for overall in the church called justice and peace and human development. So the whole area of human development, the church has offices at various levels. We only talked of parish level today. We could also have talked of diocesan level. Also, national level. We could also talk of the universal level. We cannot talk of everything today. Some problems, some situations are beyond what one parish can do. 
within the diocese, the bishop may be able to handle that. Sometimes the whole church in the nation, sometimes some areas in the world are devastated by attack against Christians, persecution, hunger, thirst, earthquake, and there has to be emergency. If there has to be the whole world together to save the children in the cave in Thailand in July this year, yeah. there can also be joint action to help those in need, whether in material things or only in spiritual matters. In you know, one of the other things, too, that we see in this country, I mean, the United States is comparatively very wealthy. And many of our parishes and even some of our college, uh, uh, college ministries will take time to go to poor countries and they'll organize mission trips. A lot of Protestant churches do that, and many Catholic churches do that, so that doctors, nurses, and dentists, and older people will go to a place and help out people who have no opportunity for such. So there are, there are also ways in which individual parishes can become very clever in figuring out Maybe we can go build houses in Mexico or something. That is part of evangelization. Yes. We have another question. Sir, where are you from? I live here in Irondale. Oh, good, good for you. And your question? It's an easy way for him to get here. <laughs> so, your question? Your Eminence, it's an honor to be here with you today. Um, there's a lot of disagreement on a parish level uh, among laity and even among pastors about whether you should attend and support your local geographic parish, uh, even if you prefer to go to a different parish because you prefer the liturgy there or a community there. What can you offer us uh, about clarity for that? Well, a person would normally go to the parish center within which the person lives, but there is no rigid church law to bind an individual to do that. So I might be in this parish, but it may be that how that priest celebrates or how he preaches is difficult for me. And I might visit the neighboring parish and find that one more helpful. Yes, there is no law against that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Unless perhaps a very big number within the parish boycotted their parish, then it becomes a bigger thing. Then it should be examined. <coughs> but if it is one individual or two or three, they should be left in peace and not in pieces. <laughs> <laughs> and also sometimes uh, in American parishes where you have different international communities who may not understand English that well, they're very free to go to a parish where Mass is offered in their own national language. Yes. So we have a parish here that has a Mass in Vietnamese. Yes. We have a few parishes that have Masses in Spanish. Yes. Uh, and, and in the big cities, you have even more language groups. So th that's something that is also uh, totally acceptable to, to do. Yes. And... Uh, if the problem goes beyond one parish, the bishop and his assistants will look into that carefully. All right, we have another question. Sir, where are you from? Uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel in Hampton, Virginia. Great, and your question? Uh, it's more of an observation, Eminence. Uh, last fall I got involved in the RCIA and uh, I was a sponsor. It was like an eight or nine month process, but the transformation with the family that I was involved with, the person that became Catholic, and the transformation within me was just totally awesome, you know, to get involved with all these people. Now my wife and I are being invited to their wedding, and, you know, it's just a beautiful thing, you know, and uh, I just wanted to say how much it means to get out there and try to do something. Excellent, excellent point. Thank you yeah. for noting how helpful that was. Sometimes, <clears throat> because many Catholics were baptized as children, 
and they have not gone through a serious initiation rite as grown-ups, they may not appreciate the riches of our Catholic faith sometimes. And some parishes have a method of approaching grown-ups so that the riches of our faith are not lost to them. Mm -hmm. Indeed, our faith is so rich, nobody ever knows the whole of it. We can always discover more. I, I, should, you know, I was a professor for uh, 16 years, and when I taught Hebrew, I learned far more than when I had studied it. And I think in general, when we teach, we learn more than what we communicate. Yes. And so this is another side of the, 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 the evangelization that God will not let us be more generous than He is. If we're giving some of our time, He will give us much, much more yes. for doing so. And I think that's something to look forward to. Yes. Let me mention one aspect we have not touched. Please. Although we have touched importance of organization in the parish, Legion of Mary, Society of St. Vincent de Paul, mm -hmm. Parish Council organizing all, we must also mention the importance of individual apostolate. Some people, by nature of their work, cannot belong to one association or the other. Mm -hmm. But as individuals, they can do much mm -hmm. and should. Some people also, if they are approached by a group, they get defensive, afraid, sometimes aggressive. But if they are approached by an individual, they are more relaxed. Mm -hmm. So some Catholics will achieve more as individuals. One man told me that when he travels by air, he always asks for a seat between two passengers <laughs> so that he will react and talk with them. It's just fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> when I, Cardinal, I generally ask for a seat at the window so that I can read and pray and sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, we can evangelize in many ways. Sometimes an individual who is a lay person with them in the market or in the in the medical profession or in the teaching, the academic field, is so convinced in the faith that that individual lay person convinces people more than the priest and the religious sister and the brother. Because if a sister, a brother, a priest he does well and teaches, people say, of course, that's what we expect from him. Yeah. But if it is a lay person with them in the rough and tumble of daily life and family life and economic hardships maintains straightness in the faith, that can become eloquent, Absolutely. individual apostolate, never to be forgotten. And you know, the role of individual parents within their families can never, ever be underestimated. And, um, and I oftentimes say, some people go fishing for souls with a fishing pole. Some go out there with a net. But if you catch one fish at a time or a whole school of fish, you're still bringing them in. And this is what our Lord wants us to do. This, I, I want to just mention your book again so that folks uh, can because we're coming right up to the end. I mean, it's, it's called The Evangelizing Parish by Francis Cardinal Arinzi. You can get this from EWTNRC.com, and I strongly urge you to get that for your parishes to read and pray over together to become more active parishes. And Eminence, would you join me in giving a blessing to our audience? May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. The, the Father, blessing of Almighty the Son, God, Holy Spirit. Son, Holy Spirit, descend on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. 
And, you know, we're so blessed to be able to have Cardinal Rinzi here and all the other various guests that we have. But it's only possible because the network is brought to you by you. That's how Mother was inspired. So keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you. <laughs>